Hey, welcome to another exciting episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm your co-host, Chad Alderson. I got Nick Hannon in the room. Nick, what up? How we doing, man? Good, good. Today, Harvest Wild. You heard of Harvest Wild? Wild Harvest? Harvest Wild? Harvest Wild, right? It's Harvest Wild. I know. I'm Thank scared. you. <laughs> Nor- well, normally, I, yeah, and, normally and I there's no it space. It's just Harvest Wild. Yeah, Harvest Wild, yeah. no space. So I didn't, I didn't jack that up at all. No, you did good. Okay, cool. That's that's a first. Uh, yeah, so basically we have Aaron, we have Michelle, his wife, and Emma, their two-year-old. And their last name's Grabiel. Yep, Grabiel. Grabiel. <laughs> um, I had to spell it phonetically for everybody so that I didn't butcher that. We had Michelle and Emma sitting here, but then... Um, yeah, baby Emma, Emma had put a meltdown too, a little put bit. put too much gum in her mouth and she, <laughs> she, yeah. she got in trouble. <laughs> so, um, Aaron, the, yeah. reason, the reason we reached out to you is because I've... We've, how many people have called us or, or mailed us about these guys? Like probably five or six. Um, obviously, you're doing something different. And I think the yep. things that you're doing different is why we wanted to bring you guys in because I think it's like your format for guiding (laughs) your format for guiding and and outfitting in general is is, i would say innovative right yeah there's not a lot of folks doing it yet there's little pockets of it but not like how you guys are doing it so we want to bring you on and and talk about the brand a bit um what you're up to how you guys even came upon the uh the concept and go from there is that cool yeah first tell us about yourself and where you're from and how you got into all this yeah, I grew up in Pal Cedro, just east of Redding, and, um, you know, just spent every day I could out in the outdoors. Uh, I was homeschooled through middle school, so my parents used it as, like, an incentive to get me to get my schoolwork done. So, it was basically, like, hey, once you're done with your schoolwork, you can hop on your bike and ride down to the neighbor's pond or ride over the creek and go fish. And um, I had Cow Creek, branches of Cow Creek around my house, and it's a really good smallmouth fishery. It was an incredible one when I was a kid, and uh, there's almost nobody fishing it then, and... We would, uh, you know, small community, so you knew all everybody land, lived along the creeks and, you know, all the ranchers because it's just a small town. And mm-hmm. so you, I just got to fish and hunt, like call the neighbor, knock on doors and go jump shoot ducks or go do whatever. And <laughs> it was a dream. I mean, honestly, like I feel bad the kids growing up there now, it's changed and it's not like that anymore for them. Um, when I grew up there, it was like, the la- I was like the last batch of kids that got to take advantage of that small town. Just I think that's anywhere, you mm-hmm. know, like yeah. it just, it's changed. Kids aren't doing much outdoors anymore. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, you know, people are worried about getting sued, you know, I mean, that's another big that's problem. A, that is a reality now. And it's kind of sad. When I was just like in high school, a kid broke his arm at one of the rope swings and then, um, they just shut down that access to the Creek and it was just through these people's property. They just let people park and walk down there and they were like, Hey, we got to post this. This kid broke his arm. The parents kind of acted weird and we all got, you know, spooked, yeah. you know, and I was watching it happen at places. I was like, what? Like, <laughs> come on. All their assets are up for grabs. Totally. You know, at that point. So yeah. you just can, letting you can understand it's a, it's a concern. It's a yeah. Concern. Well, I mean, it's, it's sad that it's, uh, you know, you go down there, it's kind of like your own risk, you know, kind of. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So that sounds like any kid's dream, though, growing up, just jump shooting ducks and Mm -hmm. fishing for smallies. and Yeah, you know, they're grabby and fun to catch. And, uh, you know, they're trout in there early in the season, so we had to do trout. And then um, high school, I went to private high school. Uh, I went to Bishop Quinn and um, Palisadro, and so I was still just, like, right there, minutes from all those creeks and stuff. So I did a bunch of that. I ended up coaching, and uh, George... Ravel and Dusty Ravel uh, has, you know, George's Lost, Lost Coast. Coast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I got to know them really well when I was in school. And then, um, you know, and that was fun. We got to go just fish, you know, a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was good. And um, then I started guiding um, for Shasta Outfitters, which was owned by John Drew at the time. And they were, he, I took a class from him at Shasta College. Um, he was teaching a water resources class, I believe is what it was. And, um, you know, I was in there and he said he owned Outfitter. And so I was like, hey, you know, I've always wanted to guide. <laughs> Would you hire this kid that's in your class who talks too much and probably he probably wanted to hurt? <laughs> 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 and uh, he said, yeah, sure, you know, I'll hire you. And so I started working for him on like weekends and for the summer. What's Shasta Outfitters? Is that just, is it fishing and hunting or they, is it? He did fishing and hunting. Yep. Um, and I actually primarily did hunting for him, mostly pig hunting at first, Mm -hmm. um, because there's so many pigs on the east side of the river. Well, it just, he just 
I think he just more needed a pig guide than he needed a, a fishing guide at yeah. the time. So I helped him with some pig hunts and all that and did some fishing. And, um, oh man, about two years into doing, helping him with that, he ended up basically getting a different job managing a duck club. And he gave Shasta Outfitters kind of the head hunting guide. And so at that point, it was kind of a good time for me to kind of like bow out or whatever. Mm-hmm. So then I just went and started my own thing at that point and, you know, was doing the kind of, I guess, guide whore thing and like <laughs> basically working for anybody that had a trip, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Like, got to do what you got to do. Yeah, totally. Just like, freelancing, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, trying to build, uh, you know, just get days under my belt, really, and get the reputation going. Yeah. Well, when, when, did, when did the Harvest Wild concept start? Uh, gosh, about five or six years ago, we started playing around with the idea and, um, we really wanted to get, um, you know, like a social media presence that was different because I, I didn't want to get on social media to, sh- to, and start exposing spots and start giving away like the local, like little, little spots that can't really support guiding or can't support people t- talking about them. You know, like they get, they get. Um, it's a overrun. precious resource that yeah, needs know? to be respected. Yeah, totally. For yeah. these little spots, you know, there's places that are big enough to guide, and then there's places that are like, you know, a little too small. And you really, I mean, maybe now and then you got to do like sneak a day in there because it's blowing 45 miles an hour and you can't get in your drift boat and go. And the guys are already in town and you want to audible and just get them on the water. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what those places are for. You save them in your back pocket for those things, but they're not to be like posted and all that. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to get kind of giving them information, give people information, give people like a different. Um, avenue to see the outdoors just from from like the um, you know just the different perspective I guess of just more like the food based and uh, just kind of looking for a way to be unique I guess um, I had a ton of people too in my drift boat that would I would talk about to about hunting because I love hunting and for a while I, I didn't have a lease for guiding hunting so basically I was confined to hunting on my own and then just talking about it when I was fishing. <laughs> and so I was just like, you know, I'd, I'd ask people, you know, what, what made them want to fly fish? And I would ask them, okay, well, if you like fly fishing, you like the idea of this sport. Um, it is a blood sport. Um, what, you know, what, what's your, you know, reluctance to hunting or would you, were you ever curious to hunt? And a lot, a lot of people would be like, you know, I really, really want to hunt, but you know, I don't even know anybody that I know owns a gun. Because a lot of people, a lot of clients, you know, from San Francisco or mm-hmm. from the Bay Area where, you know, they might not have a friend that hunts or... Or grew up as lucky as you did yeah, doing that stuff in yeah, their backyard. Yeah, ex- exactly. And then yeah. another big group of people you talk to that moved out here from back east somewhere where they grew up hunting, but they get to California and it's so restricted. There's so much private down by the city. And then the public land's so hard to... I mean, you got to know what you're doing to really hunt, mm-hmm. you know, Um in on our public ground and be successful consistently and so i was like you know i I really wanted to make it um like hey we want to teach you how to do these things on on your own we don't necessarily just want to take the people that just want to go jump in a blind and just like shoot the shoot their limit and go home and like that's it and the ducks sit in the freezer we want to be we want people to like feel like they earned it i want them to be able to maybe go out and duplicate it and get you know have a little success out there on their own um and people that really are like kind of more food driven and so that's kind of like how we wanted to spin it to kind of get it rolling a different way so well, let's you didn't you didn't kill your deer right you you harvested it and you didn't um you just didn't go out and harvest something you you, you educated somebody how to do it the right way and, and do it a, a fun way and educate them at the same time and and that's that's what it's all about you know it's just not all going out there and taking away from our resource it's about giving back to it and doing it in a you know friendly manner you know, yeah eco-friendly manner right i mean that's that's exactly it it's yeah. um it's a big deal like with outfitting you know and guiding like you know like you, you've got all this time all these demands on your time right and when you go out and you guide a hunting trip you go out and you work really hard to get these people an animal or to, you know and have them have a successful trip and if they get something down you know it's real easy as the outfitter to be like hey listen i'm just going to gut this skin this really fast mm-hmm. we're going to get this done and we're, we're going to move on um, it takes a lot more time to sit there and slow down and describe to people what you're doing, why you're doing it, have them get in there and do part of it with you, um, or even have the coach them through doing all of it, you know? And so that's, we really want to like, let people know like, Hey, we're here. We will spend the extra two hours it takes or whatever to teach you to skin this animal, gut it properly. Um, you know, how to take care of the meat. And then, uh, we want to be their support 
like we want to still continue to be their support when they get home and they're pulling a pork loin out of the freezer or they're pulling a roast out and they're like, you know what? I had, I looked at these two recipes. What do you think? Or where should I start when I'm trying to cook this? Because, um, that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and we don't really make any money on, on any of that. Right. So it's just like another drain on our time, but we want, we want this to work and we want people like new people to get into this so bad Mm -hmm. so that they can help, you know, keep the torch going and keep these public lands in shape. I mean, I wore my, my uh, backcountry hunters and anglers shirt today because, um, you know, that, that's a big kind of reason why we, we did it too, you know, is to get the new people in and so that they put their money into conservation. They put their, you know, their, they vote for conservation and to keep things, you know, wild and keep them where, where people can recreate on them. You know, it's mm-hmm. one thing to preserve something and there is a place for that, but, you know, conserving things is great and it makes it so we can still use them. Um, so, you know, just trying to get that promoted. No, that's well said. Yeah, the I mean the educational piece that you just talked about resonates with me because we're trying to activate new new you know anglers basically and then yeah. for a, a lot of that reason for the political power that it comes with it once you know we we kind of unify as a community we can you know hopefully vote and you know affect legislation whether it be water rights or whatever. Yeah, uh, exactly. So we're that's that's awesome to hear. Um, the thing that you were saying, you know there's the day that you book, but then you book a client, but it's also when they get home and they're, you know, they're digging through the freezer trying to figure out how to uh, deal with pork loin or whatever. That's that, that's that part that I think what I was talking about earlier that you guys are doing different, right? Or there, there's this more of a curated kind of experience. How do you say experiential, experiential guide sort of where you, it's not just you show up at at nine with, with Aaron and then, you know, 4 p.m. you're done the relationship doesn't stop there right that's, no exactly. that's my takeaway which is, is pretty cool yeah I like think. your website says hunt fish gather field to table clinics right that that whole just the the second the gather and feel to the table i think is is an interesting pretty um, cool. add add on to just being in the guiding industry right you're not just hunting you're not just fishing but you're you're doing these other things that was you kind of bring it back to how man used man and women you you used to survive right yeah that's pretty it's an awesome it's just an awesome experience i think everybody should should check out yeah you you know know? and it's like uh when we were at the sac expo down there i did a couple talks on like sustainable like um you know keep for fishing you know like they we have limits that are set doesn't Mm -hmm. mean you need to keep your limit because you want to keep some fish keep what you can handle what you can cook at the time Mm -hmm. you know fresh fish is the best there's no reason to take fish home and freeze it you should have it that stuff in the smoker the next day or eat it that right then if not i don't see a big reason to keep it i mean obviously you go to like an alaska trip or something where you're going to keep a whole bunch of like salmon you can vacuum pack it it's Mm -hmm. that's a different thing and that's a once in a year trip that people make you know it's not like you're doing it every single day and filling up the freezer yeah that's not the back you know running out here and grabbing a striper for dinner or you know go and catch a couple shad and and uh bringing them home um so you know we're i don't know what's your what, what was the inspiration for bringing all that together like that um you know, it was basically we had the idea to do it. And then I actually called John, my, the guy who got me into guiding. And I was like, Hey John, I've been, Michelle and I have been brainstorming. We can't come up with a good name for this. And this is what we want to do. And he's like, I own this.com, uh, harvestwild.com. And I was like, you say what? He's like, I think it'd be perfect for you. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great brand, man. And it's I was a like, really no great brand. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, he's like, I actually had this idea very similar to what you're doing. He wanted to do mostly just hosting and not necessarily like actually getting the ranches and doing it the whole entire thing. Right. Um, and so I was like, well, I want to like get the ranches and be the guy running like the whole entire deal. I'd love to do some hosted stuff with people, but it's so hard to get you know, book this date and then have these people that are interested in this one thing, be able to show up on that one date. It's Mm -hmm. much easier to say, Hey, we offer all these things, contact us if you want to do it. It, And then we will price it according to how many people you can get to come participate. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, can you talk, just kind of like go through the litany of services that you guys have, like the experiences you guys provide. Okay. So we do, we do clinics. Yeah. For hunting, fishing, um, for fishing, you know, we'll do fly fishing and then spin fishing clinics, and we can be species specific to those. Um, we do the hunting clinics as well, and we'll do like upland, waterfowl, and then big game, or kind of like the way we break it up. Um, and those are 
we go through everything from like how to draw your tag for big game, um, you know, and then how to like e-scout, like scout online and find your places to go, go scout, find the animals, and then, you know, go out hunt and, um, you know, process the game, how to take care of it out in the field. Um, there's a ton of people that are very scared about like, they, they think that they're going to somehow like ruin it. I mean, you can ruin game, but there's not that many things you need to do to really keep, uh, keep game in good shape you know you just got to cool it down you got to expose it to the air you want to skin it and get it you know where it can cool down get it in the shade um i can't believe how many people you know that's what the, they're, that's our biggest you know thing is like, well, if I, yeah their biggest concern is like i'm gonna you know go out and get this deer well how do i cut it up i'm like well the big thing about cutting up a deer is that if you accidentally cut it roast in half you just made two smaller roasts you didn't ruin right, it you right. just made it maybe not <laughs> usually used for making stews yeah or, you know putting you know, in a crock pot yeah or, i mean yeah. if nothing else you totally butcher it you can do jerky or burger with it you yeah, know like exactly. <laughs> making some burger with it yeah you make it happen um you know you can't be afraid to make some mistakes you know it's gonna happen and you just do the best you can and there's a lot of avid hunters out there that don't even know that stuff yeah right they take mm-hmm. their their game to a butcher shop and then it gets processed for them there i mean yep. you just don't, they don't even know that whole system and yeah. I, I think your business opens up the doors for even those people to mm-hmm. to get involved yeah right? well and, and even learn from if you take it to a butcher that butcher doesn't necessarily like game right yeah. Like not everybody has a taste for games. Some people just don't like it, you know? That's just the the fact of it. And so your butcher might not necessarily like venison. And if he doesn't like venison, then how good of a job is he gonna do coaching you on your first deer you bring in on how to butcher it? Mm. You know what I mean? He's gonna have you maybe do a lot of things that somebody who really appreciates venison wouldn't want to do, you know. He might be grinding it all up in a hamburger and getting rid of a whole bunch of great steaks and roasts that you could be taking advantage of or something like that. And so that's another reason, like another thing that we do is if we're not just, if we're not going to help you butcher it and you just, you know, your time restraints or whatever, you don't want to take that on yet. And you just want to take it to a butcher. We're going to, you know, go run through a bunch of different cuts that you can do and things and different ideas in order to have a butcher properly cut it because he might cut it in a way that you end up making, you know, spaghetti sauce and tacos the rest right. of the season. Right. So is there, is there like a little classroom kind of a co- environment that you do this in, or you just do it on the the tailgate of the truck, or how do you how do you <laughs> like get that info across to people? Um, well, so we have um, for the hunting stuff. I mean, we do on on the water clinics, you yeah. know, and so we'll like get a day use area or something, and we'll just you know pay the fee. We have National Forest Service permit for Shasta Trinity, so we'll go over there and we'll do like our you know on the water stuff there whenever we can. Mm-hmm. Um, for the hunting side, we have an incredible facility that we lease for hunting um that's just east of redding and um it has a complete butcher facility it has a hanger for hanging game um we're in the process of probably going to get some like goats that we can slaughter and use for um classes when it's just going to be like a specific just like butchering class or something um so we're going to have you know so we're going to do those things um, but we have that property there and, um, it's incredible and we can do the whole big game class there. Uh, as, you know, we, there's a bunch of good like glassing points so we can show people on a map what it's going to look like on a topo, what it's going to look like on satellite imaging, and then actually drive them up there and go, now this is what it looks like from here. Mm-hmm. Now you know what you're looking at mm-hmm. because putting those, being able to go to a place you've never seen and, and do it from start to finish like that. And c- just connect those dots. Yeah, it's connecting yeah. the dots and it yeah. makes it where people are like, Okay, like I see how it works. Even if you see it on a as a topo map or know how to read a topo map, and then you go to that spot and look at how vast that country is, and you know how deep those canyons are, it, yep. it kind of blows your mind a little bit. And then mm-hmm. how easy it is to get lost, or mm-hmm. you know, track your game after you shoot it. I mean, all those things start to come into play a little bit. You yeah, know, exactly. So. And then being prepared to take care of the game when it's down in the canyon. You know, people go, I can't backpack in and 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 kill a deer two three miles in. I'm like, yeah, you can. I'm like, because if you're just hiding from the truck and you wing it and it runs a mile before it dies, then you go find it. Now it's a mile from the truck. You're going to have to do the same thing right. there as you would if you were backpacking in. You're going to want to debone the game. You're going to want right. to put it in a backpack and hike it out if you don't want to be safe about it. I mean, I've been plenty of times where I wasn't prepared and I end up shooting something and I was like, I probably shouldn't hike so far back here and end up dragging it out. And it's like, oh what, man, this is so dumb. Where's my backpack? And then what, what's like mad a, at you because you're not home oh, for dinner. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> what, what's an average, average-sized average doe that you kill? 
don't. Well, I'm kidding. It's a trick question. <laughs> uh, so, but bu- buck, like, what's your average size bu- buck? Um, on the ranch, well, um, we're, we're hunting C zone. Uh, they're probably like hundred inch, hundred and twenty inch bucks. You know, because we're doing a lot of beginner hunts. We're not really targeting like like tr- specific trophy. You know, deer. We're trying yeah. to get people a good experience and get a nice clean clean shot. So. Really, what we're focusing on is a great experience for new new hunters right now, and so mm-hmm. we are working on getting more than the size of the deer, getting them a nice like I want them to be have the opportunity to hopefully spot the deer, stalk the deer. I don't want to mm-hmm. drive up on 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 the side by side and be like, "There's a deer right there, just shoot it." Like right. that's not the experience we're trying to get. We're you're to you're get basically teaching experience. them how to fish. Yeah, you know, exactly. like that that meta, that yeah. yeah, yeah, totally teach a man how to fish. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah, and so. Yeah, so we're trying to get them to, you know, stock it, get into range, wait for a perfect broadside shot, um, if not, you know, a slight quartering away shot, and we're going for, you know, the, the, the thoracic cavity, the chest, hoping, you know, to get a good, solid, clean kill that um, that's ethical and that is promoting and teaching these guys the right way to do it, and these guys and these men and women mm-hmm. to do it correctly, and... So that's really where our focus is and the size of the deer, you know, some guys like, Oh, I don't want to shoot that little fork and horn. I want to wait for maybe, you know, like a three pointer better or whatever. Then yeah, we, we oblige that. But, um, really what we're focused on is just like the good, clean, ethical kill. We're not trying to push the envelope and to get a big animal or anything like that. Yeah. We really want these beginners to get that's that, pretty cool. that good first experience. You want to bring Emma on the show? Have her say hi. She ready. She's she ready for her debut. <laughs> 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 puppy, 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 huh? A little too embarrassed, I guess. <laughs> Is that a turkey? What's that? Is that a turkey? Uh, what did she say? Oh, wow. What does a turkey say? What does an elk say? Yeah, she's so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> she has a pretty mean elk call. Though. Yeah, really? she does she when does. she gets she going. She has her own bugle tube and everything. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you guys uh, have elk as far as hunting goes? Yeah, uh, no. No, it's I too, mean it's too private and yeah, well, hard to get a tag. The ranch we have, we actually we we may have one elk hunter on this year. Um, we don't have. A PLM program on our ranch, so people have to draw a C zone tag or draw a northeastern elk tag mm-hmm. to hunt on it. So uh, we may pick up one elk hunter. The problem is that elk actually yes! they summer on our place, but once the rut kicks in, they basically migrate. Uh, the bulls that are on our place they generally migrate over to the next ranch, kind of down the hill, mm-hmm. because that's where like the cows all are. So when they're mm-hmm. you know, so they just vanish basically. But the back corner that kind of goes out into that ranch there are there's a big rim there it's about 600 acres so you know almost a square mile that they still will hang on um but it's not enough to support more than like a hunter basically so we might do one elk hunt there Calif- california is a lot different than any other state when it comes to hunting how do how do the ta- how's tag system work because i have no idea i've never shot a bow well, that's or, where i was kind of going to go with that yeah, yeah like how's it how's it all set up how's it regulated like okay. what are the zone all that stuff i'm re- real curious to understand how that works yeah so Basically, you have to put in for a tag. You have to, well, first, you have to do hunter safety. That's the first thing you have I to do if that. you want to hunt. Okay, yeah. good, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. And don't and you lose check, your You card. have to have your certificate. Yes. even Because oh, if you go out of state, go you, want, you want that. You need it. To, I got it like eight years old or something. It's kind of a rite of passage when you live in Princeton. So do you know how yeah. to get another one? Do you have to file for another one? Or do you have to take the class over again? If they have a record of it, because we actually had to do this when we put in for Colorado a few years ago, and I didn't have my hunter safety card. And so I called the office in Sacramento and they actually luckily had a record of mine and they put like a, they were really great. It was like a week later it showed up at the door. Oh, like, wow. um, so that was cool. Um, so you might have that opportunity, but like I actually have had some clients that end up having to retake hunter safety cause they hunted back when they were kids and they're in their like sixties or seventies and they have no records and they've never bought a California hunting license. Even if you bought a California hunting license just before the electronic system, if you don't have a, that old license and you go in to get a hunting license, they are not going to let you get a hunting so license. So I'm screwed, basically. Sounds Probably. Like, yeah. Okay, so you get, the, <laughs> you get the hunter safety and then it's broken up into regions or something? Yeah, so there's different zones, they call them, and um, they you know blanket the entire state. 
Um, the easy ones that are over the counter are like D, A, and B are the are the easiest zones. They're pretty much all over the counter. And then there's a bunch of different draw units. And then like the X zones tend to be the premium zones, and so they can take a lot of point, a lot of years to get points to draw. How does that? So every time work? you put in for a tag, which is before June second, mm-hmm. if you don't get the tag that you put in for, so say you put in for C, you get Southwest and you don't, miles, and you don't get it exactly, you basically okay. get you get a point. One and they point, roll over to the next year, and they keep, like you, a cell plan. If you don't get the tag for the next year, yep. And so okay. some of the tags, like he's talking about, X zones are, are premium tags, and you have to have eight points that year to even be looked at to get one and it's not guaranteed that you're going to get one it's it's but can't you just buy a politician like on billions <laughs> well you can buy plm tags yeah, you, yeah. What, those are what's the plm uh, stand it's for? private land management okay. and so ranchers will work with dfg and dfg mm-hmm. will have a biologist come out and say hey if you do these improvements then we'll allow you to set like a season and you can have x amount of tags and so they can actually set a more lenient season on their own property, but the tags can only be used on that ranch and the ranch you can only hunt with PLM. So if you have a friend who happens to draw a tag for the zone where your ranch is, you can't like let technically let them on your ranch to hunt because it's a PLM. It's like its own zone basically. And does that landowner get a, a percent of that, that fee? Yeah, he'll pay. It's a lot more expensive. Like he has to pay like a, like a base rate basically to get into the program. And then he pays... I think deer tags are like sixty or seventy dollars per deer tag, whereas normally you know for over the counter it's like twenty five bucks when you buy a tag um, for your first tag, something like that. Um, so yeah, so it's a but then he can charge whatever he can get for him, you know. So the real legendary ranches, those guys are you know can make get a couple grand per tag. Wow. Okay. Huh. Um, you you mentioned e scout earlier. Can mm-hmm. you talk about that a little bit? What is that? Well, that's like uh, going on like Google Earth or Onyx Maps, which Onyx is awesome for fishing and hunting. It'll show you where public and private is so you can access things and make sure you're being totally legal you're about legal, it. Yeah. And you're not going to have some guy come down with a shotgun. It's the way to find loopholes in the property lines. Totally. That's 100%. What I, that's what it is. <laughs> yep. And then, uh, and so you can go on there and look and see where you know, good feed is, where good cover is, where water could possibly be. I mean, it's not as good as boots on the ground, but... You can do it sitting on the couch, you know, yeah. like around my place right now, we have a lot of like Mickey Mouse and stuff going. And so I can sit on the laptop <laughs> while that's cranking and check out some spots and see, um, you know, and, and be able to do it from the cat, you know. Okay. So I'm going to give you a scenario and then you walk us through kind of like your steps, your, your process for e-scouting. Okay. You're going to go up, um, somewhere North of say Lake Almanor in some, in an area of high lakes or whatever. What do you do? Like, what do you, what, what software do you use? What's your methodology? Like just step us through because this okay. e-scouting thing we've, we've talked about, Nick and I have talked about doing a whole episode around it. Cause I'm big into it myself. Okay. Um, so I'm asking purely for selfish reasons right now. Cause nice. I want to maybe learn something new here. If you bring up his Google but, account map and you look at it, it's, yeah, it's, it's not stupid. even a map anymore. It's stars that are marked of all, his, all of his places that, Either he, I've that been he's or been or, or wants to go, to go. for know? fishing or hunting. Fishing. For fishing, because fishing, you said yeah. you haven't got yeah. license. So, yeah, so, if yeah, I started so doing just, that, it would just, I don't think you'd see so green just, or um, anymore. Just talk about like your thought process when you when you apply this technology to go, you know, qualify spots to go fish or hunt. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, obviously the first thing is access. So mm-hmm. you're looking for access. Mm-hmm. Um, excuse me. Um, you know, so you're, you're, you got to find where there's an easement through to whatever ground or river you're trying to get to. And an easement is, um, it's just any, like either a public, like a, there can be private property with a public access road through it. And sometimes they'll be gated and you have to walk them. And I mean, and that, that can get a little tricky on figuring out which places you can, you know, there's a lot of timber company land that used to always be open that now they're starting to shut down, which is really a bummer because a lot of it mm-hmm. was really great for public access. Goes back to that kid breaking his arm. Right. Yeah, totally. It's, li- it's all about Yellow liability. Gate. Liability and then, you right. know. They're also concerned with road road, road maintenance. maintenance. Road yep. maintenance. I yeah. mean, well, most of a lot of it was just foot access, so that yeah. wasn't too big of a deal. But also, you know, now that, you know, the state of California, if a fire starts on their property, might come after them or fed, you know, or somebody yeah. might come after yeah. them if there's a fire. And that's, um, you know, if it was started by somebody that they just, you know, let, yeah, I, I think it all comes down to the the ri- risk mitigation. That's always the root of it. It seems yeah. like the road the road maintenance thing's bullshit. I think it's just risk mitigation. But anyway, um, we digress. So I want to <laughs> I want to get back to Squirrel. software you use 
And then like, you know, you're going to go look at something at High Lakes above Almanar. What's your, what, what steps do you take? So you kind of like, you kind of started it. So you almost yeah. went like the main road, right? So the main freeway or road to get to the nearest place, right? Of access. And yep. then from there you got to kind of. Yep. You're just going to pick like your, your, your best way in and you can use a, you know, that's when your topo is going to come in handy. Cause then you can see what the gradient is and you can figure mm-hmm. out, you know, there might be a road that's closer but it might be at the base of a cliff. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, and then there's a road a little further, but it's, uh, you know, flat mm-hmm. or, or a little, you know, little incline or whatever to get there. So finding like the easiest path, not always the shortest path. And, um, so you use topo maps, like you'll look at an image on Google earth and then reference that from, well, a, on that's a topo what map. the, that's what the Onyx is awesome for right. maps or to go hunt. Um, they, uh, you know, you you can click satellite and you got your satellite imagery and then you can click, um, um, there's like a blend, I forget they topo, call it. Like a yeah, topo it's, filter? It's, it's, yeah, so it has a topo that's like translucent over the uh, over the satellite imaging, and then you can go just to topo if you really want to see what the topo is doing. Um, I, I would say like the biggest thing for me, honestly, that I have found in all of my scouting and all, the, all that I've used it for is for elk hunting, finding like bedding areas. Like you can look at this mm. big old hillside and find this one little flat spot in this gnarly canyon, this one little like tucked away little cool little spot for him to bed in a flat spot. And you go hike out to that spot and you're just like, Oh yeah, the elk live here. Like it's just beaten mm-hmm. to like, there's nothing left on the, it's just dust. They just in there every day. I don't know how many spots I found that way where I was just like, Oh, it looks like it might be a little, so you're just there. looking for little flat, flat places on the topo. Yeah. I mean for the elk it's, bedding, you know, yeah. that's the so one thing thinking about this too. waterfall. Like, Oh man, there's this big <laughs> drop and there's gotta be some toads sitting down there below yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Or above it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. And then, yeah. <laughs> like, so it's onyx it's all- and, Google Maps, pretty much, right? Yep, yep. And okay. uh, the Onyx is sweet. It's like an app on your phone. Yeah, we do the same exact thing then. Yeah. I, that's exactly what I do. Yeah. I, do but I save, also use Google. Do you for, save those searches. maps to your phone so that when you're off yeah. cell, satellite, you can still see what's yeah. going on? Yeah, and that can be an issue because, you know, you're, you're like, oh, crap, I didn't, you know, I need actually the one next to this map. I should have got a little more. And then you're out there and you have terrible service and you're standing like on your tiptoes on top of some ridge trying to right. get it to download. <laughs> yeah. So make sure you've downloaded the right ones. Yeah. And the only other thing I would add to that from a fishing perspective, the other thing that I do personally, um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, they do fish surveys everywhere on every major river and every major lake. So you can get uh, an idea of biodiversity and also amount of fish in an area um, by doing some pretty interesting Google searches for PDFs of these these research papers. They're internal memorandums that the uh, the state you know basically shares within the department, um, but they're all available. Some through, of them are pretty old, though, long, right? Long you know, they they are not current. But some go back to like oh eight. Some of them are, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, some of them are five, ten years old. But I found right. some high lakes with brookies in them using that method. That's awesome. So that that works. Um, yeah, and they they don't they don't do those surveys every year though. That's right. that you know it's like every seems like every four or five. Seems like and it just kind of rotates. But okay, I so, just gave away some secret sauce. But you still have your topo map on you, right? You still have a topo map with you most of the time. Um, it depends on where I am, you know, like how hard it, I'm, how easy it is to get lost. Mm-hmm. If I'm hunting somewhere where like the road's at the top of the mountain, and I know like no matter what side of the mountain I'm on, if I go, go up, to the top, I'm gonna, you're get, gonna hit, it, I'm yeah. hit the road. Then right. I usually don't bother with that, with right. any kind of backup navigation stuff. Um, but if I'm in like real flat terrain where there's like less landmarks, and I'm like, okay, so this is easy to get turned around and then I'll tend to have, you know, backups mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because I, you know, I've hunted some places where it all looks the same and you're just like, okay, so which way is which, what I think that little hill over there. Have you like heard of, hill. have you heard of gohunt.com? Yeah. Yep. Do you, are you a member of it? Yeah. Is that, I mean, I'm trying to remember which, I mean, which are Onyx and Go Hunt the same or no? No, different. Okay. Different. Yeah, Go Hunt is, and they have yeah, Onyx is the one I have. Mm-hmm. Onyx is awesome. I mean, it's like if you're serious about trying to find new spots to go, and you're worried about trespassing, you need an Onyx account. Period. Go Hunt's more about um, having those preference points kind of laid out in front of you and knowing where where mm-hmm. you can put in for what's your best chance of probably you know success with those points that you have available, and it's. They don't have it for California yet, do they? Or do you, you know, know I don't know if they do or not, but they, yeah, they're specific to getting you tags. Like your best right. ability to like 
draw a tag or be able to go hunt mm-hmm. and like a, have a successful it's hunt. a really cool site um that i know a lot of my hunting buddies love yeah yeah let's talk Check cooking yeah i was just gonna talk s- cooking that's where i wanted to go michelle, we got michelle and yeah i get it are you you're you're part of that right <laughs> here put these on step up to the mic until before she starts uh she likes black black licorice, huh? she comes. yeah bribery ew I know I don't like black guys either. <laughs> but you guys, you guys are very much like partnered together on this this venture, right? You both, it's kind of a team effort. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, let me unmute you here. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. So, uh, Michelle, what's your role? What do you do primarily with the for the biz? I um, basically do all the back end stuff. So I do a lot of like, I did built our website. So I learned and did the designing for our website. It looks good by the way. Yeah, it looks really good. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Uh, I organize all of our newsletters and put fish reports together and hunting reports together. And I gather as much information from Aaron I can and I put it all together. Um, I communicate with a lot of outside people like, um, for example, like Enjoy Magazine. We just got an Enjoy Magazine as a featured article. So I've been talking to them back and forth for about a year so trying to set things up like that, get more exposure, do a lot of the marketing side of nice. it. Nice. So ops and marketing. Sweet. Yeah. I was, why did I think that you were like, you helped like get certain clients you that wanna wanted s- to learn how to cook, cook the uh, stuff that they were catching. <laughs> Who's doing that? Which one of you is in charge of that? Because I want to talk food. The women cook, right? No, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm but, totally kidding. Um, she's slinging, really she's, she's slinging arrows and, and harvesting, right? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, Michelle's been, um, you know, since she became a, like a stay-at-home mom, as they say, but, you know, we launched Harvest Wild kind of the same time as mm-hmm. we had our daughter. So um, she's been trying to be a stay-at-home mom while having like me and my scatterbrained, like, <laughs> um, like, Hey, we're going to do all of this. Like, we're not going to just do like, most guys can just do like one thing or two things. We're going to just do all of it. And I need you to like book it all and run the website and build the website. But that, That's why you guys are, that's <laughs> your biggest differentiator. You guys are doing like a really 360 degree experience and not just one thing. Yeah. And you're doing it pretty well from what I've been told. I've had, again, multiple people call us and be like, you got to get these guys on. Yeah, that's awesome. And raising a child at the same time. Yeah, Congrats yeah. to you guys. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> it's important to us to be able to do it together as a couple. You know, yeah. a lot of, it's very one-sided, especially the outdoor community. A lot of people think like, well, just my husband goes out. Well, no, <laughs> like you should go too, you know, and I get that a lot. I get, it. I get a lot of questions that people are, that don't even know where to start as a woman in the outdoors. It's very intimidating. So um, it's cool to be able to have that aspect of both you know a man and women be able to do it together yeah and we hunt together we fish together we do it separately um, and we uh, bring our daughter we took her uh, backpacking when she was a year old and she, she when, tried her first brook trout when you've got a couple and and the, the gal hasn't ever done it um how do you guys kind of like uh alle- alleviate the anxiety that they have uh I, I would say baby steps you know like you have to get something that's like going to be sort of a slam dunk, like a dove hunt or something where the food's mm-hmm. delicious, like dove or awesome. I don't know anybody who doesn't love to eat a dove. What's your favorite way to cook it? Um, I like to like half them and then do them like a, almost like in a stir fry or, um, you know, and the dove poppers are always like everybody's like standard. Yeah. But I try yeah. not to just like do too much jalapeno and cheese and bacon. Cause then it's like, where's the dove? There's right. a little piece of dove in there. I swear. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> but, um, you know, and then, I like to put them in like, yeah, like stir fries or cook them like as a standalone and then and put them over like some veggies or something. Um, so you like to start them with a dove hunt because it's easy. Yep. Right. Yeah. A dove hunt's easy. Um, you know, you doesn't need a lot of gear, right? You can like get a loaner shotgun, go mm-hmm. shoot some trap, get like a five gallon bucket that hopefully isn't bright orange, sit on it on the edge of a tree line or by a <laughs> pond and shoot some dove, you know, yeah. like super basic, really easy. You don't, you know. You just wear like normal clothing, like blue jeans and like a brown shirt, and you can probably kill some dove. And, then, and so, do you guys, are you guys getting more couples because of this? Yes, and families, and we're getting. That's cool. Um, you know, been getting a decent number of like father son groups that where I can, like I can't believe how many dads are getting into hunting now because their kids have interest. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where all these kids' interest is coming from. I don't know it's if it's Joe Rogan, baby. It's Instagram, yeah, yeah, Instagram, and then you know, and I I think like maybe. 
like Hunger Games, you know, because she's like yeah. you know, shooting the bow and shooting birds out of the sky with the bow, and these kids. Are like, yeah, oh, I, I think learn. honestly, I think it's Joe Rogan because yeah. he's he talks about it all the time, and there's a certain contingent of UFC f- fighters that are into it as well, yep. and a lot of them were converted by Rogan, and it's just part of the culture now. It, it seems like totally. you know, and then there's the whole paleo thing going on, and it's all kind of just intersects. Yeah. You know? Yep. And it's funny because you know now with a lot of kids in school get kind of like bombarded with some like the ethics of like factory farming and mm-hmm. all that stuff at young age. And I think some of these kids are like, well, you know, I can go hunt my food. Like, yep. you know, I, I can't tell you how many times some older guys told me, he's like, can you imagine like that when people go to a grocery store and they look at that package of meat, they have no idea like how that got there or how it is. Or if there's an animal laying there, they have no idea what to do with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have an abstract idea of how it got there but I definitely don't know what cut of meat it is. I mean, I couldn't point, I mean, it's a, it's a round or whatever. I wouldn't be able to be up, like walk up to an anatomy thing and say, oh, that's that part of the cow. Yep. But so many you people know. don't, you yeah. know, don't know where it's come from. But it, I think the biggest thing too is finding that connection with their food. You know, now it's such a big deal that people don't know where their food comes from. So having that connection and learning where their food comes from mm-hmm. is such, you know, it's such a big deal. We haven't bought meat really at, at our in our household for a long time. It's like there's duck, there's deer, there's elk, you know, fish coming out of the freezer all the time. Like we're, I'm just pulling that's stuff so awesome. and defrosting and going home at lunch to, defro- you know, just defrosting it. And that's kind of how we've, I feel, I feel super lucky yeah. to honestly we, be able to do that yeah, and, not, and totally not worry it, we're, about We're lucky just living from. where we do geographically. It's possible to do that. You know, I lived in Santa Monica and it was just unheard of. You couldn't just couldn't yeah. do that. Right. Just logistically, you can't get past the 405. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. yeah what's your what's your favorite uh piece of the deer that's um, kind of it's random it doesn't like not meat but like if you were to eat like the heart or liver uh, yeah or, i mean the heart is super good i don't know that i have really a favorite the heart we tend to eat first i don't know if that makes it our favorite but it's super good but Honestly, these blacktail hearts are so small that since Emma has been old enough to eat like real food, she she doesn't she pretty much downs a whole deer heart by herself and we're left <laughs> yes. with the scraps because she loves it. <laughs> I know her favorite. Bike. Yeah. Why do you guys eat it first? Um, I don't know. I think it's just because it's you know generally you just eat it like in camp. You know, you um, just throw it in a little salt water or whatever and like brine it for a little bit mm-hmm. and a little brine and then uh, you know cook it the next day and um, that's just kind of how we've always. And a lot of times, too, we butcher our deer at home, you know, so sometimes being in, out in the field, it's readily available. It's, it, you know, it came out of the animal first. Yeah. Um, you don't have to actually break down the animal to be able to pull it out except for um, gutting him. And then also it's the first thing that goes into the freezer when we get home. It's like, it's just, mm-hmm. know, it's right there. Yeah. So. I saw a cool uh, recipe on Meat Eater um, where he was taking the stomach lining mm-hmm. and then wrapping the heart. With yeah. with the stomach lining and then it was it was a certain part Maybe of the sausage stom- or something? stomach lining right it was, it was well a, it was the fat it was the coal fat okay yep thank you mm-hmm. and, and it, uh, yeah it looks like it's like, like netting cheese cloth. Yeah. it's like netting it's like netting oh okay yeah meatballs too I think he's done it he's is that is, yeah. is that tripe or no different tripe no tripe is actually stomach okay right? that's like yeah. the Mexican or who right. does that one yeah but um they uh this is actually the fat that's outside of the stomach that's uh, just around the intestines okay. and the okay. stomach and all that. Yeah. And a lot of the <laughs> eating that determines what your uh, entry and exit <laughs> wound kind of look like, right? Cause oh, if totally. You, if you, Are you talking about, I'm confused, if you, talking about <laughs> the toilet? <laughs> your entry and exit Basically, wound? yeah. If you, if you <laughs> hit the bladder or, you know, oh, really? the poop sack, then you've ruined a lot of the stuff that, yeah, that you could potentially it be It literally eating. does roll downhill then. Yes. Yeah, you know, and that's why we are, you know, when we're guiding those hunts, it's like broadside, getting the animal, stand still, nice, close, easy shot, because I want to be able to get in there and show somebody like a nice, clean, you know, gutting job and skinning job and not have, oh, look, we're like trimming out half of the shoulder because it's, you know, we, we whacked the shoulder blade, which we actually did last night. I guided the upper sack yesterday out of the raft and then had a uh, pig hunting client last night so we, i did fishing all day and then Jeez. we got pig hunting last night and he got a pig and so, all on the same day yeah and was so, it the same guy casting and blasting guy. different guy casting wow. and blasting. yeah so Dude. sent one guy home met the other he must guy. have been dog ass tired well you know for Renewed that stuff <laughs> for that, for, you know <laughs> he loves it. i love all that so much and like i've been chomping at the bit to be able to 
do yeah. these trips and get a lease close enough that I could pull it off. And I yeah. finally got this lease that's only 15 minutes from my house. And so I can run home, drop a boat, hook up the side by side, run over, meet a guy and go out and hunt pigs for the Did evening. Did you get your pig? Yeah, we got the pig. Nice. Um, it was, it was a pretty fun hunt. We did, uh, we did this bit, we hiked probably like a mile loop and ended up shooting the pig like a hundred yards from the side by side. Like we could see this, <laughs> we were actually worried about shooting the side by side because they were kind of heading towards it. Um, but, uh, it was cool. We got to do the hike thing. Like I like to do and stalk them and we had the wind in our face. So it was just, it was great. We got in really close. We were in bow range, but we shot, we ended up, you had a rifle, but. Okay. Do you take both? Um, we do sometimes take both the guys that want a bow hunt generally, cause a lot of the pig hunts are kind of shorter, like duration, like a day mm -hmm. or two. Um, I usually encourage guys to bring a rifle if they really want to have success because then I can just have the rifle on a sling over mm -hmm. my shoulder and they can have the bow. And if they wind us and they run out to 100 yards and stop for a second and they're out of bow range, I can be like, hey, take the rifle. Okay. Let's so make some pork. I know that I'm going to assume bow hunting is way harder than, than a rifle rifle hunt. How much harder? Um, I would say the biggest thing that makes it harder is actually the amount of time that you need to practice and you have to you have to make that a part of your life practicing with a bow the muscle memory piece of it yeah like a rifle i feel like you can in my opinion you can shoot you know a, a half a dozen times or a dozen times before season and you're you're going to be like totally dialed and even you know and and you'll be fine with a bow you need to practice like multiple times a week and it's for building up those that muscle memory that muscle and yep. whatever you're mm -hmm. using to pull yep. that bow and knock it and hold it in place yep. right and the guys who really really are really proficient with the bows most of them practice daily even if it's like in their garage you know cameron haynes is like a huge like you know shoot every day yeah. guy and that's because it's that muscle memory like you're saying Nick. like mm -hmm. you just want to get to where no matter how freaked out you are because you've been running up this hill after like the biggest deer you've ever seen your whole life when you get to the top of that hill your body's just going to go through the shot process like you're not going to have to think about it that's huge because you know as much as we want it all to go smooth when you're out there in the field it's the wild and mm -hmm. the wild is like take no prisoners everything's life or death you need to just be ready to do it. And so that's why the practice is huge. The same thing is just like if you're going permit fishing to Mexico, you know, and you mm -hmm. got to practice, you got to stand on an ice chest in the windy days mm -hmm. and try to, you know, throw yeah. a tight loop and, and a lot of wind. Preferably with a pinch barb. When you see that permit or you see that buck, right, you, that you start freaking, you get what called, you get, I call yeah. buck fever. Buck, do you yeah, get buck, buck fever, fever on permit too? Yeah, oh, permit yeah. fever. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. For sure. It's not as crazy as, as big game hunting. It's, that's yeah. a whole yeah. different level to me. Well, unless it's yeah. like a chip shot permit. And everybody's, everybody's a little bit different. My brother, he doesn't even get that anymore, you know, he, but uh, huh. I still do, you know, yep. uh, I think everybody's a little bit different when it comes well, to that. So, um, practice makes perfect. If you've got a bow and assume that you've been shooting at least three times a week, how important like to success is the actual stock before you actually get to pull, draw the bow? The stock is huge. Um, the biggest thing is learning thermals, I would say for stocking game. Because um, so learning Air where current. the wind's gonna go, because honestly, like stocking up on a lot of game, like yeah, they have good eyes and stuff, but you can usually with all the camo we have now, and if you just have like just like the most minute little bit of cover, you can actually stalk in and not be seen. You just go real slow and you're patient. Um, but the biggest thing that ruins, I mean, once you've got those things down, being patient, moving slow, and knowing how to use the terrain, mm -hmm. which I would say is the easier part to learn. The wind is just crazy because I, I mean, the wind's the thing that no matter what you do, it will, it'll screw you basically. Like, you know, you think you got it dialed and you're like, okay, the wind, you know, it's 10 o'clock every day at 10 o'clock in the morning, the wind's been shifting and then going uphill from, you know, the, the morning thermals going or the down drafts over with mm -hmm. and it goes up and you plan your stock and you think you got it dialed and you get over there and it's 1045 and then the wind starts going straight downhill to the deer, mm -hmm. the deer's gone. I mean, that's the hardest part is getting the playing the wind. So do you have like, a, do you have like a decision tree already set up in your head? Like, so the scenarios basically like that you're going to be, you're going to be ready for if the wind shifts, right. I'm going to do this. If it shifts left, I'll, I'll do this. And I ask that because when you're playing baseball, like every time, every pitch, right. You, you're on third base. you you know, you know, there's a guy on first and there's a guy on third. What am I going to do? If yeah. balls hit to me, it's that kind of a situation. Exactly. Is it similar? Yes, it is. It definitely is. And, you know, you a huge part of hunting and something I encourage people to do is, like, I really like over-the-counter tags that I can get every year. Mm -hmm. The premium tags are cool, but the time it takes to go scout a unit you've right. never hunted and try right. to learn it and really maximize that hunt 
it's going to be basically a year ender for you to go and learn that place and go and really hunt it successfully and oh, geez. And okay. really do a great job. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. Um, unless you have a good friend who's hunted a bunch who can line you out, like hands you maps and goes, this is how you do it. Yeah. Then you, and you got to go figure out yourself. It's yeah. a lot. Um, and that's why over the counter is awesome. You can just, you know, dedicate year after year and you have to look at it like, you know, like how long does it take to get a college degree? Okay. Well, that's what it is to go out and harvest deer successfully and consistently. Right. So you need to go out and you need to commit three, four or five years to like going back out and, you know, repetition of going in those areas, learn, okay, if I'm, if the deer are bedded in this draw, if they leave, they go to the saddle. If I know that because I've seen them exit, or if I just make a lucky guess, I'm in a new spot mm -hmm. and I spook them and I just hightail it, sprint up the hill, go around the backside and get to that saddle. I can beat them. A lot of times they'll slow down and stop in some trees or whatever. And you can get there and you can, you can cover your own escape route sometimes and, and end up getting animals if you know it. Um, what do you mean escape route in case you get charged? What do you no, mean? Not, not for you, for the deer. Oh, okay, I got it. <laughs> I, I, I've never done it, so I got yeah, a bunch no. of dumb questions. No, those good. are good questions. Um, drones. Drones? Do you, yeah, do you use those at all for scouting? Um, No. No. No, I don't. Um, I just don't. The drone only shows me what I can already see on Onyx. Right, I mean, right. Really. Um, right. And mm. I... And you can't disturb the wildlife. With yeah, it. I was just yeah. curious. Yeah. yeah, because it's in the regs now. You can see it like they've actually included it into the regulations yep. and that you can't use it uh, within 24 hours of making your kill. Yep. Is right. this just for hunting, not fishing? Because I use it for fishing all the time this if is, I'm in a new yeah, spot. Just for hunting. That's how I decide to go hunting. up or down river. <laughs> right. If I'm in a new spot. Yeah, just for hunting. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, not for the stock, I guess, for like footage for a pretty shot or something like that. Yeah. Stocking right. that is really important is the physical preparedness. And if you you can practice archery, and you know, especially the bow, you can practice all the time, but if you aren't physically prepared, the stock is typically going to be unsuccessful. Um, Why? Because oftentimes like the situation changes. The thermals will change, the, um, the deer or the elk will get up and walk in a different location. You have to be able to back out and think you know through the process again and you might have to actually hike another mile so you have to, to get kill, back to you got to be per physically prepared to call an audible essentially yep. is that right yeah. okay yeah. Yeah. yeah you can't let laziness kick in yeah like and uh, fatigue. I'm, I'm screwed then and my that, stock would be <laughs> shit every time and that is <laughs> no, no, how important funny. is your diet in that situation too I mostly try to eat Snickers bars when I'm backpacking <laughs> and hunting I was actually going to ask he, what, he what's in your pack for, <laughs> for fuel um, you know, jerky. I always try to make a bunch of wild game jerky before I go, just so I feel like I'm like doing it. You know, I got mm -hmm. like my venison jerky. Live it, live yeah, it. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. But then I do, I do honestly buy like the Costco box of Snickers before the hunting season, and I usually have at least a Snickers a day. You're burning so many calories when you're hunting that some empty ones, like my Snickers, is like the thing. And my I usually have like dehydrated apple and like almonds and all this like healthy stuff, and then my Snickers bar. <laughs> 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 I really love like the little. Um, Gosh, I forget what the company is, but they make the little peanut butter and uh, almond butter packets. And then if I'm not backpacking, which is like day hunting, I'll have a, an actual fresh apple in there and then like cut it up and put almond butter or pe peanut butter on it. It's so good. And nice. it's like kind of cool and, you know, it's moist. So and no everything. fancy energy bars or any, any of that crap? I mean, I've bounced around. I usually get a different one each year because by the end of hunting season, with how long my season Tire, is with guiding, and then yeah, the I'm same like thing over yeah. and over again. Yeah, except I'm, the Snickers. Do you? Yeah, the Snickers you, guys, you can keep doing. Do you guys wear <laughs> hydration packs on these these things? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I love like the the hydration packs, like the Osprey one. I think mm -hmm. it is the one I have. And what um, gear bag awesome. do you like to use when you're hunting out there? You for know, hydration and your all your stuff. For the most part, I hunt with Onyx or a uh, XO pack. Um, I had a Kafaru. That was a really good pack. Um, but through some misfortune, I ended up needing to just get a new pack. And I was right next to Exo hunting in Nevada, or I mean, uh, in Idaho. And um, I was like, yeah, uh, you know, called them up. I need a new pack like right now. And they're like, oh, we'll make it happen. Like, where do you want us to ship it? And they just like shipped it to the post office so I could pick it up and, wow. and keep hunting. Yeah. And, um, and so I end up with that pack, and honestly, the, that pack is awesome. Um, it fits really good. I've packed out a bunch of, like, heavy, heavy, like, over 100-pound loads of meat with it and had, like, no soreness. It was actually pretty incredible, really good pack. And so I pretty much use it for everything now because I love it so much. Hmm. It's huge. I think it's 7,500, so it's wow. big, and you really have to strap it down and cinch everything down when you're just, like, day hunting with it. But 
it's um, become a part of you. It sounds like. Yeah. Well, and it then it's like having a smaller day pack that you can't really pack a deer out with. Sometimes you get in a situation where you got to go back and get a frame or something to pack an animal out with. And mm -hmm. I've gotten now where it's just like the extra pound that my big pack weighs or pound and a half or whatever material, might as well just have it mm -hmm. and so then you're ready. I've always pictured when you pack an animal out, it's like some of those old Westerns I used to watch where they had the entire beast slung over their shoulder and they're I've like pictured ticks going down their back and shit. <laughs> yeah, like all the stick and yeah, guys. Yeah, like so when you guys when you guys break it down to transport it and move it out of a, say, a canyon or whatever, do you quarter it or how does it work? Well, in California and uh, – in Oregon, where I mostly hunt, um, you can you you can debone them. You don't need to leave any bone in. Um, there so are you, that just basically means you take the meat only. Be like if yep. I was going to flay a fish and leave the rest. Yes, exactly. On the show. Only okay. the meat. Yeah. Okay. Um, the issue with that is that it won't last as long, so you'll need to get it butchered and like frozen or cooled mm. sooner. Um, if you keep it in big quarters, big muscle mm. groups, then you're not exposing less as air. much. Yeah, you're exposing less bacteria to the meat and stuff, so it'll mm. last a lot longer. If you need to hang okay. in camp. Um, so those are the, kind of the considerations that you need to, hmm. you know, think about. And you take plastic bags with you then? No, well, you don't want to do plastic bags. I will take, I have like one plastic bag just to keep blood off my backpack while it's in the backpack. Yeah. But I actually had, um, like my stepmom stitch up these little, um, meat sacks that were actually the perfect size because a lot of them are kind of too big. And when you're divvying it up to get like a pack to pack nicely, it's, it's tough with bigger bags. So I usually carry a couple bigger like the QU zippered bags. I really like those ones um, for the bigger muscle groups. And then all the smaller stuff, I have these little ones that are probably only like a, maybe like 11 inch diameter. And they, uh, they're awesome um, because they're just, you know, they're, they're small, they're narrow. And then they're maybe like mm -hmm. two feet long. And so you can just strap them in underneath gear and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, they, uh, they work really well. So that's usually what I have it. And then you can hang them in a tree easily. Like if you're solo, the other problem with big bags is when you're by yourself and you're trying to like hang like this heavy bag of meat and get it. And then you like, if you drop it, you're going to puncture it. Then you're going to have issues because then flies can get in there and then you're trying to like, you know, fix it out in the field. I like the smaller ones. Do you ever solo on these, these hunts? Yeah, I do. I do solo. Not a lot. Um, just because of the, you know, time restraints, you the know, inherent I, I could, danger. Well, I, that I actually, I I think you're si like you feel if you, safer yeah. when you're by yourself because you don't have money, somebody else with really? the happy trigger finger no, standing next no, to you. No, no. I just feel like worried about a snake bite or something <laughs> crazy. You know, if you if you're cautious when you're out there and you're mindful and you're observant and you you have your basic knowledge of like you know navigation and first aid and all that, yeah, you're gonna be fine out there. I mean, most likely, people that take unnecessary risk or like to push the envelope, they're usually the ones, you know, or the people that are just have no idea and are oblivious. You know, those are the people that get in. Um, I, when I am by myself, I definitely don't quite take like as gnarly of routes across like rock mm -hmm. faces and yeah, stuff. Like I turn mindful, for especially if I don't have cell service, like if I happen yeah. to be somewhere out in the back country, but I happen to have cell service, then I'm like, Hey, I'm going across an early spot. Text like, you know, Michelle, yeah. she's a home or whatever. That was my next question. Me an hour. <laughs> is like, do you, do you have like a GP, like a, what a, the, the satellite stuff, like the Garmin in reach or something like that? Um, do you use shit like that or no? Uh, my dad has one. And so when I, so when I'm solo, sometimes I'll borrow that if he's right. not using it. But, um, other times I just don't. Ever been bit by a snake? Uh, not a venomous one. <laughs> I like it. You're firing from the hip. I, I was thinking about sh uh, boots as you were talking about your backpack. And, Is that boots? Uh, yeah, boots, like okay. your shoes that you're wearing. Because, yeah. uh, and, and everywhere is different. You start going out of state, you kind of have to use stuff that's a little bit thicker because it's cold, but mm -hmm. California is pretty warm. So you can get away with some thinner layer insulated boots. But what do you have something that you like? that you like to use? Yeah, the I, I like the Loa boots. Um, a Loa? A Loa? No, Loa. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, I... They have some really lightweight boots that are like as light almost as like running shoes. I mean, they're are these ankle light. like ankle height yeah, or um, they're, up to the calf? They're like three the quarter. yeah, like the three quarter height or whatever they are. They're not mm -hmm. all the way up on the calf, but um, like high top ones. But you can get them, and they're oh gosh, what is it? It's like the Sierra, Sahara or 
I don't remember what the model is, but it's basically like they come in like a beige, a tan color, which mm-hmm. I really like because they don't t- absorb heat as much as like a dark boot. Mm-hmm. And then around here hunting in like tan colored grass, so they actually blend in better too. And so your feet aren't like these mm-hmm. black things moving through light colored grass everywhere you go. Um, so I really like those boots and they're, they make a Gore-Tex and a non-Gore-Tex. For archery season, I use the non-Gore-Tex for the most part because they just breathe so well. Like it's, they're awesome. And they have a fairly soft rubber sole so they're pretty quiet for stocking um i like to take my boots off for stocking when i'm bow hunting for the most part ask if you were take your shoes off yeah whenever i can i take my shoes off Um, that's what the native americans did man that's how they got so close you can get you can walk so much quieter it was like my buddy uses slippers you know Mm -hmm. he he keeps his slippers on and just okay so at some point the last you're you're trying to close the last 30 yards or something you is that the situation yeah last like 80 yards 100 yards depends on how loud it is never been snake bit (laughs) <laughs> what kind Dude. yeah <laughs> but, holy smoke but what cool. gender yeah. I've, I've had no I, I have no idea what it's like to hunt with a bow but i've always told people it's the pinnacle of of any outdoor sport i think probably just just thinking about all the things that would have to come together to be successful at it you know the hardcore outdoor people that i know um they say that bow hunting for elk is yeah is, is the shit yeah it's incredible it's super fun um it's something that we still have, like we have great numbers of, so you can buy over the counter tags and go have like a legit opportunity to go harvest an elk and like cool. at least have a great hunt. And they're, they're really, really fun. You know, they call, you can call them in when you're bow hunting, you know, it's a lot of times during the rut and, uh, you get, you, you also get to kind of, you can hunt as a team well when you're elk hunting because having a collar and then shooters in front of the collar is very successful way to hunt them. Mm. And so, um, it's, and it's like kind of. It's a great one that you, you and your buddies can go and plan and do together and kind of learn together. And um, whereas and deer, deer hunting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, said, I said buddies. But yeah. Just well, you sure don't have to date qualification. every girl you know, babe. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, it's something that, that's great for, for a group kind of setting, you know, and you get to work together as a team. Yeah. And if you have a bunch of guys that are like, you know, you all have the same mission and they're guys you really trust that, you know, you can like, that are going to work as hard as you are to get animals down. It is so fun to be out there in the woods with your, with, with, you know, your friends and family and, um, doing those things and hunting, hunting like that super hard. We were going to talk about gathering. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, did you, oh, did you pause? No, no. Oh, um, no. yeah, that, that made me, I was going to say with groups of people, um, you, one of your guys's, um, other pieces of this pie is the gathering piece, which I think is awesome. And a lot of people are getting into. What does that mean? It's not just hunting mushrooms. It's hunting all kinds of different edible. Like psychedelics. You guys hunt? Uh, no, we generally don't. (laughs) The classes get kind of weird. Um, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, we, we (laughs) we mostly try to do, um, you know, the edible greens, because they're, there's a lot that like are just like weeds in people's yards. So it's something that people can do on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Mushrooms a lot, unless you're like really dedicated to go drive out, you know, like the same way that you're going to be like a dedicated fisherman or a hunter and you're going to go out and actually look for these things, then uh, mushrooms can be real, like, can be a lot more difficult than just like a lot of the like kind of noxious weeds almost, you know, that you can basically are in your law and you're trying to get rid of that you can actually throw in a salad and eat. I had a buddy come from the East Coast huh. and he's like, you guys have blackberries growing everywhere? I'm like, what the, yeah, what is going on? Ass. He's Tear like, there's blackberries waiters. all over? This is awesome, you know? Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just funny to think about it, you know, like. The I see him and I just get pissed. <laughs> <laughs> well, can't go down that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where's my machete? What's an example of, of a plant that we take, we don't think about what we see all the time? Um, well, like, um, gosh, put me on the spot. I know, you, I know, you guys have a certain person that yeah. that, that does this. What would you, you say? Yeah, we have a bo- yerbasante. Yeah, yerbasante is a it's a medicinal plant, and it's um, extremely fire resistant or tolerant, and so it'll it's like one of the first things that comes back after a burn. Um, you know, people in California are probably familiar with what a pot leaf looks like, so it kind of looks like pot leaf. Um, it's kind of a shiny leaf generally because I was like. Um, almost like a uh, like resin on it it's like a um, wax or something yeah okay. on it and it's really good for like you have a cold or something you make tea with it huh um and that's something that you can get when you're hunting and fishing around northern california in a ton of locations um and it, like around uh redding where we get it all the time is kind of like that I don't, know, I don't know what elevation maybe like a thousand feet ish elevation it tends to just be like everywhere um 
and they do a lot of prescribed burning like around Shasta Lake and it mm -hmm. comes back in that in those prescribed burns like crazy and a lot of people don't like it because it's not like a you know I don't know it's kind of like brushy does it know? have a brown branch yeah it has little, a long stem yep, and yep. then it has most of the foliage will be at the top yep, yep it flowers kind of pretty for a short period of time right. in spring I know what you're talking about um, now and um yeah they're you know so that's one that's around that like most people have probably seen in their wanderings around northern california that's so and you guys will take people out in, on, in groups to do stuff like that too then yes yeah that's cool um you know and we do the acorn processing classes so what? yeah so processing acorns which is like a way underutilized thing around here you know I've, I've, most people are just like trying to figure out where to put the acorns some years you know on their property or i, I know my mm -hmm. place like the gutters are totally full but um you know how to make flour with it so you can bake with it um how to you know make like we did a lasagna with acorn in it and um you know there's a n number of different things just so people can start to play with it you know and like kind of figure it out but like yeah. we make cookies actually they're pretty good it kind of has a hazelnut kind of flavor to it like an acorn tortilla would taste um if you could do yeah it. i mean it the problem is is that it it has no gluten and right. so it doesn't stick together very good right. it's like um when you do a cookie it's you know, like it just, it like kinda. you bite it and it just falls apart in your mouth, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, so some butter and sugar and some acorn and, you know, you got it kind of, got it made, but. That's so Michelle, uh, we, she, I wanted to ask you earlier, but you, we were, we were watching Emma run around all over the place, but <laughs> we, we just went off about hunting and fishing. Oh, and, back to the services. Yeah. So I, I wanted to give yeah. you an opportunity to, to, you know, give you your 30 second. Yeah. or elevator. hour however long you need <laughs> <laughs> can you guys talk prices too or is it variable um we can um general i mean it's kind of yeah it's there's probably people that are gonna listen to their services and be like well i wonder how much it was or how <laughs> yeah. much it would be yeah it's a lot because we offer and we can adjust it according to people's needs too so if they're like well we really want to learn how to butcher the animal on site well then we can add that service you know so it's just mm -hmm. it's also based dependent on each guest that we have mm. um but in all so we started harvest wild april last year um and we offer so it's hunting fishing gathering and wild game cooking um so for fishing we have we do fly fishing conventional tackle and we have a raft a drift boat and a bass boat and we have a shasta Tree national forest service permit and a blm permit so we can go to some pretty incredible places yeah. a lot of places people can't go to and we have the tools to do that um and then for hunting we also have um so we do you know guided hunts and clinics um and that's for fishing too we also do the like fly fishing clinics like on the water clinics i think you covered that um and for so we, we have a kawasaki mule so we have um that we use on the ranch it's great especially for like the road conditions but for people of all ages you know it helps get people that can't have like have a hard time getting around as yeah much as they mm -hmm. you know would want to when they're in their younger years or or young you know so we can cater to a lot of different um folks and then we also do like an all-inclusive package so you know your meals and um everything's kind of included your lodging as well so we offer that for our hunting and for hunting we do upland so turkey quail deer um we may do an elk eventually um what am i amazing hey oh, and pigs <laughs> our big one <laughs> wild boar yep um and then we do foraging so um so we do clinics for that we do nature walks we bring people out um, and take them out and you know and usually do like a two-hour nature walk we kind of walk and talked about the plants that are around us people that walk past these plants all the time and they don't know that they are here for us you know uh, and then we also have a wild game um, cooking chef on board for with us and he teaches our wild game cooking classes oh okay so um, we can do private and home chef services as Whoa. well as put a class together and yep. teach like you know oh, for example cool. like we'll have um we'll take duck for example and then yeah. we'll prepare it three different ways in that yeah. class but, but conceivably i could say hey i want to book you guys for like a boar hunt and then it's two days and i want to you know for two nights i want to know how to you know dress it and cook it and, and all yeah. that good stuff and then i want to hit the river 
Then I want to hit the river. Yeah. Day five. <laughs> yeah. Then third night, get a bunch of mushrooms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see where this is going. It's genius. <laughs> yeah. Look. So the 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 thing the biggest hurdle on uh, on those classes um, for us is the wild game cooking one is that people have to supply the game right because we can't sell game so we can't supply game for a wild mm-hmm. game cooking class people have to have it so. Um, generally, you know, that, that's been our biggest issue is people are like, oh, well, I want to learn how to cook duck. I'm like, okay, or, so you have some well, ducks in your freezer? <laughs> we got no, a dependency no. on you. You better go find a friend or somebody who can give you some because <laughs> yeah. if I'm selling you the service, it's a little too close to the law for me to right. just be like, right. hey, I'll bring some ducks over and yeah. teach you how right. to cook them and get paid for it. I'm like, no, you got to supply the ducks. That's and cool. That it's important that, for them to be able to harvest the animal that they're going to be cooking. Well, yeah. you know, that so. takes you back to the beginning of your services. And yeah, saying, totally. Yeah. Hey, you need to do, set up. Well, what? Okay, so you guys do a shit ton of stuff. So, what's your most popular thing that you guys do? Well, I, you know, I was right mainly now. a fly fishing guide before it, and so mm-hmm. that's still the bulk. Um, yeah. But then, you know, we're getting a lot of people doing their first time hunts. Um, you know, and generally, you know, this time of year it's pig season, you mm-hmm. know, cause it's year round. And so right now it's, we're doing, so the it's kind of seasonal then. Yeah. For yeah, the pigs. Makes sense. And then we'll, we have a couple weekends left in July to book, um, for pig hunts. And then August we won't be booking any cause it'll be getting too close to deer season. And we're going to kind of let the ranch rest a little bit and get prepped up for the deer hunters. And we'll be doing Very rifle cool. deer hunters there. So, and this is all kind of at, based out of Reading, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the greater, yeah. What about, I, you mentioned waterfowl. Um, where, where do you guys do that at? Um, so with waterfowl, basically we, I end up, you know, like I know a handful of guides that are down the valley and Mm -hmm. we'll end up just getting a day with them. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times they're doing me a favor because someday they have blocked off for their family because a lot of my groups are booking kind of late and then, um, we go down and, you know, and hunt with them and then go through the whole field, you know, dressing and the whole Mm -hmm. process generally Mm -hmm. is why, you know, the people that are there for that. Mm -hmm. And, um. So, yeah, so it's usually, you know, Calusa, you know, somewhere like that, Corning. Cool. Yeah. So, and then, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say, too, something that a lot of people don't know is that we can cater to big parties, too. Um, we just did a 50-person uh, father-son camp out. Oh, wow. Where we did camp out plus um, fly fishing, and we brought in, like, 17 guides. And So, you guys, there, we, we have quite a few listeners in the Bay. So, if, okay. if anyone's listening, maybe thinking team building event, you guys could do something like that. Yeah, Sounds yeah, like, we can make something yeah, cool happen for 20 sure. 20-plus, easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And cool. cater all the food, too. So Yeah, okay. It wouldn't be Sweet. wild game at that point unless That'd they wanted fun. to bring a whole bunch up. But <laughs> yeah. 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 So, how do these folks uh, get in touch with you guys? Um, they can go to our website, so harvestwild.com. Um, they can sign up for our newsletter. That one goes out. We try and get a newsletter out once or twice a month. Um, they can do that right from our website. They can call us. Um, What's the number? 530-356-2189. Instagram? Yeah, Instagram messages work. Facebook messages yes, work. Please what is, follow what's us your on Instagram, Insta? Facebook. What is it? What's your handle on Instagram? Uh, harvestwild underscore HW. Okay. And... Um, then email, you know, is always like great. It, um, and that's harvestwild at gmail.com. What about uh, Facebook? Are you guys on Facebook? Yep. And what it's just it? Harvest Wild. Harvest Wild. Right. Harvest Wild com. Com. Give okay. your phone number. it is? I can't even keep track. Give your phone number one more time. Uh, 530-356-2189. Cool. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so we're very personal. So feel free to call us anytime. Thanks for coming on, and also I apologize that my dog stared, literally stared at you for half this show. I like your guys' gear, too, your hat and your shirts. Can they get that stuff, Yeah, too, yeah, as well? Yeah, your brand's yes. awesome. Yeah. You guys did a good we job. We have swag available, yes. It's on the website. Swag. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle, who do you guys host with? Who's your, who's your internet provider for your web host? It's Squarespace. Nice. You guys did yeah. a good job on it. We tried a different one, changed WordPress, it. WordPress. Yeah. Is your, is your um, e-commerce site on there, too? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, she was so good. I was impressed. She was putting every single crown back in pl- in its place, and then I, when I looked back over, it was upside <laughs> down. Dumped it back out. <laughs> <laughs> She's gonna start back over. Dude, she just built a, a five piece t- tapered leader with blood knots. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. we train them young. Train them young. <laughs> she did a really good job for being here in the studio and having her parents yeah. be on the mic. That was, it, like, she yeah. did good. She's awesome. Our house is not a sweatshop. She's not there just building leaders. <laughs> <laughs> Flies, man, it's a different story. Okay. Yeah, well, she loves being outside. We have goats and chickens and uh, dogs. Awesome. And she just very loves cool. It. Yeah, cool. Well, yeah. thank you guys for coming in. It was awesome meeting you as a family, and um, we wish you all the lo- best luck. Go thank check. You. Go thank check you them out, you guys. Yeah. If you're listening. Thank you for having us. Thanks for listening. Yeah.
your turn to plug it. I plugged it last time. Rate us. Just say rate us. It's okay. Rate us on, on anything you want to, you can that you access via Google or iPhone or what? Spotify. Yeah. You can't rate through that stuff though. Yeah, yeah you can. Yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Peace out. <laughs>